Good morning, Emmanuel, and happy Father's Day to all of you fathers and spiritual fathers out there. You know, you don't have to be a biological father to be a fatherly influence on people. And so we are so thrilled that uh, you are a part of our lives and the influence that you have. We're all better for it. So we're grateful um, and thankful to celebrate with you today. Many of you may even be at the drive-in service right now. Uh, We wanted to make sure that the sermon at least came through well, and so we're recording the sermon ahead of time uh, until we can make sure that we've ironed out all the kinks by doing a live broadcast. We've been uh, working really, really hard, thanks to Ron Gines for his willingness to help me uh, with so much of this uh, technology stuff last night. So we're hoping that you'll be able to participate in the live broadcast, but if not, at least you'll be able to hear the sermon. James is one of the most practical books in the scriptures. Uh, I think it's fitting then that we look at James on Father's Day as so many of our fathers give us such great uh, practical and foundational advice. And so we're going to be looking at James chapter 1, verse 19 through 27. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and take that along and read along with me. James chapter 1, verse 19 through 27. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and, after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, He deceives himself, and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the the world. This is the word of the Lord. James 1 presents a diverse range of material, uh, much of it uh, common wisdom which is here rooted in a theological context. While there is no rigorous logical development in this passage, James does present us with a number of associated ideas that together illustrate the two essential links of this text, which is between faith and practice. His central purpose is to issue a call for the observance of a faith that practices rather than a mere formal profession of faith. In this, James echoes the thought of the great prophets. He urges adherence to the perfect law that gives freedom, a phrase that constitutes one of the thorniest interpretive problems in the New Testament. What we can say is this. James not only calls us to positive action, but also to eliminate immorality. Eliminate immorality. He knows that mere intellectual assent is often accompanied by an anemic will in matters of morality. In making this case, James teaches a central paradox of the faith. God's gift to us also lays upon us the responsibility of moral behavior. Let me say that again. God's gift to us also lays upon us the responsibility of moral behavior. This passage unfolds in three movements. Verses 19 through 21, James argues that to receive the word with humility is better than to speak in anger. Next, he teaches us that simply hearing the word is without value unless it results in action in verses 20 through 25. And the last two verses provide a transition from doing... um, doing to the the question of pure religion by setting a number of specific examples that add flesh and bone to the general points made in the second movement. True religion is not merely works, but a humble receptivity to God's word so that it can develop deep roots within us, shaping our character until the natural result is the 
the sort of good works that James announces that we should be a part of. So let's look at the first movement. Receive the word in humility. Speak without anger. The gift of God's wisdom influences how Christians speak. Believers should concentrate on listening with humility and meekness rather than speaking in anger. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Again, great fatherly advice for us, isn't it? What is certain in this passage is that it finds its home in the Jewish wisdom tradition, which placed a premium on measured speech and studious listening. The powerful appeal to community um, and unity in chapter 3 makes it possible that a part of that a part of the thought here is a plea to peaceful coexistence among believers, being slow to say rash and angry words to others within the Christian community. It's enormously helpful to know the problems that James was facing in order to understand why he would choose to address this issue with the fellow believers that he's, that he's writing to today. There are three essential, three problems, if you will, that he's confronting to his readers as we're reading it today. He makes clear a number of the significant ones, and so let me go over them with you. The church had become divided over many issues, and here are three. Some sought to use their church, use the church, as a means to display wealth and to exercise power. Others taught a doctrine of fellowship that denied the centrality of the command to love one's neighbor. And a third, still others, had shown obvious favoritism to the wealthy. Now, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see some of the applications to today's Christian, particularly to the American evangelical. Whatever power, influence, or financial blessing the Lord has seen fit to allow us to have, He has not done so so that we may lord it over people manipulate a political system for our personal or even corporate gain and keep whom we believe to be our enemies far from us. That's not why God has blessed us with power and influence and any financial blessing that we might have. He didn't do it so that we could have power over people. Whatever wealth, power, and influence that we have been blessed with is for the purpose of followers of Christ being salt and light in the world and demonstrating the love of Christ through our generosity. Whatever we have been blessed with, it is so we can love courageously, serve radically, and give sacrificially to everyone, everywhere, every day. How can it be that the words of James written almost 2,000 years ago, can be so poignant and relevant today. This is why I'm so passionate about what I've just mentioned to you. And I realize that I, I'm teetering on the edge of some doctrines and political ideologies that, that make some of us feel a little uncomfortable. They make me feel a little uncomfortable in some ways as well. But here's what James is saying. And, and so you can take issue with him, not me. And just trust me that, that as someone who has read and studied why people, particularly young people, why they leave the church, I've read a fair amount about this. Here's, here's, here's why they leave the church. And James addresses this this morning. When we use the church as a means to display wealth and to exercise power, when we teach doctrines of fellowship that deny the centrality of the command to love our neighbors, which includes liberals, people of color, homosexuals, people who have had significant and even public moral failures, and even those who believe in pro-choice. When we teach a doctrine that views people, no matter what they believe or what mistakes they have made, and when we show an obvious favor to, the, to those who are wealthy above everybody else, and we further marginalize the poor, we divide the church and we ruin its witness. 
In short, we destroy the church. You can read book after book as to why people are leaving the church. And I can tell you that I have read many of them and many articles and sit in on seminars. It's almost always pointing to the three things that Paul just referenced. Let me read them to you again, the three things that he referenced. Some in the church sought to use the church as a means to display wealth and to exercise power. They taught doctrines of fellowship that denied the centrality and the command to love others, to love one's neighbor, and showed obvious favoritism to the wealthy. And, and I can just tell you that, that in the top five reasons why people leave the church, particularly young people, these three are frequently mentioned. Well, why is this a big deal? Well, it brings us to our next point. When we do these kinds of things, often it's driven by human anger and neglects the righteous life that God desires for his people. In, in verse 20, James seems to confirm our suspicion that in the background it is to be found a concern with the character of Christian community. For he says that human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, we should be slow to anger. James uses the words the, the word ergazatai, and, and so the phrase should be translated, for the practice of human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. The practice of human anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Human anger, which is the product of of an underdeveloped willingness to listen, and it's at odds with God's righteousness. This all puts, fo puts focus on how we have been wronged. That's why we get angry. We focus on how we've been wrong. We take on, uh, in other words, a victim mentality. We can't hear and know the word of God, the character and the path that God wants us to follow. We can't know the character of God because we concentrate so much on how we have been wronged. Outbursts of anger do not produce the kind of righteous behavior God desires to see in our lives. We might better paraphrase the sentence like this, righteous action does not spring from anger. But there's more to it. In verse 21, James speaks in more expansive terms of this life of righteousness by opening with the word therefore. According to this principle, in other words, James makes it clear that he is concluding this line of thought. The conclusion opens with a brief list of behaviors that should not, be, that should not characterize the life of a Christian. The first involves both restraint and renunciation. Christians should get rid of, the NIV says, or to strip off certain behaviors. Originally, this word was used for clothing, like we were getting ready to be baptized. If you were baptized, you remember that you went into a little room probably and you began to take off your clothes and put on a baptismal gown of some kind or baptismal robe. That's the connotation. In other words, they are taking off the old way we used to be and look and putting on something new. We should get rid of or strip off certain behaviors. The word carries with it the idea of a total and complete conversion, a complete change of life pattern. James instructs us to remove moral filth and evil, to remove the dirt and the filth, the greediness and the moral uncleanness. It has the connotation of an abnormal growth of wickedness or even cruelty. James wants no vulgarity, moral filth, or evil to be present within the Christian community. Christians must not only turn from anger, but from evil and hatred. Whether it's a random hatred or a random bout of anger or premeditated, we're supposed to get rid of it. But turning from evil is not enough. James also places before us an alternative path. He says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. 
Now, listen, this is, this is critical stuff. God's spirit within you and I should direct us into his character and his will and his wisdom. The attitude of humility characterizes the one who was converted. It no longer is a life of evil and wickedness, but one that is marked by, get this, it is no longer marked by evil and wickedness, but it is marked by calm and concern for others. Calm and concern for others. Our attitude is to be one of humility, recognizing God's wisdom relative to our own poor resources in this regard. The way to salvation is to be found in meek listening to God's word. This posture is unnecessary if we are to accept the word is, is necessary if we are going to accept the word that's been planted in us. Humility is significant not only because the attitude is necessary in order to allow the word of God to flourish within us, but it also is essential, an essential attribute of the poor, those without resources who are dear to the heart of God. Humility requires us to remain open to the life-changing message of the gospel. You do not have to have it all figured out. I don't have to have it all figured out. We are to be humble, express humility as we Hear the word of God and allow it to be planted in us. God's word has the power when planted in us. God's word has the power to save us. We must remember that the New Testament, we've talked about this before, but it presents a a triple pattern of salvation. We have been saved through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We are being saved as the word of God transforms and changes us. And we will be saved when he returns and calls us home to glory. This triple pattern helps us understand the shades of meaning that attend to being planted and the word of God being planted within us. It presents with us, to us an image of growth. And growth takes time. It must be nurtured. It must be developed. And in order for this kind of development to happen within us, we have to humbly receive the word of God. The word of truth that we receive from the Lord in his word, in the teachings that we receive from godly people, in receiving things in prayer. They have the power to save us because of Christ's death and resurrection and the Holy Spirit doing something marvelous within us. We're to nurture it for it is a motive, a motivating force in the process of, of saving us. We should note at this critical juncture that, that James carefully highlights the saving power of God's word, which when it grows strong within us creates Christian character that results in righteous righteous action. But we can't be just hearing the word um, because hearing without doing is worthless. Jesus himself contributed to the, this tradition in, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. While both Judaism and Jesus understood holiness to be tied to this doing the word, their radically different definitions of holiness led this led to, to a divergent direction with, between Judaism and Christianity. For Jesus, the center of God's character is his compassion and mercy as expressed in the greatest commandment. Luke chapter 10 verse 27 says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. For his contemporaries, holiness had to do with purity and therefore with separation from the world. This is why the gospel is not being spread effectively because we are practicing the law rather than delving into significant relationships with mankind. Both views of holiness require a life of action. James makes this point with the present imperative do, which has the force of continue to do. 
It's not just something that we do once, but it's something that is planted within us. We take on the character of God and we become a people who continue to do the good work and word of Jesus Christ. We must continue to grow in carrying out the commands laid on us by our hearing of God's word. This hearing is most naturally the public reading of scripture in the context of worship. But hearing alone is insufficient. To hear and not to take action is to lie to ourselves. Having introduced the the idea of, of future judgment, at the second coming of Christ, James, war- James' warning to us it takes on new consequences, grave consequences. In verses 23 through 24, James turns his attention to a, a negative example in the form of a proverb. The person who hears without acting is like a man who looks in a mirror and then forgets what he looks like. James's point is that the image in the mirror, whether the, the product of a sly glance or an adoring long gaze, quickly dissipates and goes away. Whatever impression forms in the mind and heart while looking in a mirror is temporary. In our mind's eye, we take a glimpse when the word is read, but it is a vision that soon evaporates and is replaced by immoral desires that the world is intent on displaying before us. In church or home group or youth group, we get a glimpse of how God wants us to live, but it is just a flash. It's a flash in the pan when, we, when we're staring in the face of greed or gossip, prejudice, um, an opportunity for a social media, media jab, uh, when we're staring at the face of, of things of a sexual nature or some other type of selfishness. That word of God that we saw in the mirror goes away. For James, perfect law and word are related. The plan and desire of God's will for your life is perfect. When you dive in God's way for your, for your life, you are freed. Doesn't that sound incredible? You can be freed from all of that stuff. Living with God in mind for the right reasons alleviates the guilt and the shame of sin because we live in His grace and His mercy. James defines law in such a way that it grants freedom from self-interest and immorality, allowing the Christian to grow into what God intends. It's not unlikely that James is here reflecting the words on the words of Jesus relative to the law. Jesus did not overturn the law of Moses. Rather, he pierced to the heart of its intention and in so doing elevated the law to something altogether different and powerful. Like Jesus, James does not have in mind a new law, but rather the fuller expression or more perfect distillation of the Jewish law. For the Christian, this law is still the will of God, but a more refined apprehension of that will. The perfect law, the word implanted and allowed to take root, is then the very teaching of Jesus. Stephen Carter writes that the law has only two functions. It makes you... It makes you do what you do not want to do, and it prevents you from doing what you want to do. The law that James talks about, the perfect law, is something entirely different. Two ties link this section to what has gone before. And verse 26 highlights um, the sin of rash speech, the theme that opened the passage in verse 19. Here it provides an extension of the idea, not only hearing, but doing good, in that worship is described as worthless without action, impelled by a godly character. If we harbor bitterness, envy, or anger in our hearts, even as we sit here hearing God's word or worshiping um, with other people, if we harbor bitterness, envy, and anger in our hearts, our worship is is worthless. Those are James's words, not mine. They are worthless unless it purifies us from those things and drives us to holiness. It must produce, in other words, in us a a godly character, the character of Almighty God. 
In both this and the previous section, self-deception plays a significant role. The place of pure religion is described here as control of speech, acts of charity, and resisting temptation. The word religious, it can refer to both the inner and outer qualities of worship. Generally, however, as in here, it points to external ceremonies. In other words, any religious practice that cannot influence the heart and therefore the actions are worthless and meaningless ceremonies. Our worship has to be a worship that is transformative. Psalm 39.1 says, I said, I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. James implies not only that rash speech has the ability to put one's faith in question, but a religion that results in such behavior has insufficient ability to shape the heart and is therefore worthless or futile. James also may have in mind that the specific example that certain teachers whose rash and angry words were sowing discord in the community. In any case, a person whose religion is like this is deceived because it has no power over ethical behavior. It, it, and as the case of the rash tongue demonstrates, it is a faith so useless before God that it can be considered no faith at all. It is the kind of, of Bible-thumping religion that breeds guilt and shame, but does little to restore or affect life change. It also is a life based on spiritual do's and don'ts. It's not a heart of flesh. James then defines pure religion as at least the kind of pure religion that God the Father accepts. He starts by saying to, that we're to look after orphans and widows and to keep oneself unpolluted by the world. This is both figurative and literal. It is to watch out for those who can, take it, who can be taken advantage of. People who live at the margins of social, economic, and legal landscapes that are often easy targets for exploitation and therefore suffer great distress. They get taken advantage of. There are systems that are created to keep them marginalized. In any event, God claims to be the protector of such people. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 18, it says, He defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow and loves the foreigner, giving him food and clothing. It doesn't matter how the person became fatherless. And, and, and there is, there's more than just death that can make someone a widow or an orphan Divorce and abandonment can do the very same thing. And can I at least invite us, I'm just inviting us to perhaps reconsider how we speak at least about foreigners, immigrants, whether they are here illegally or otherwise. Can I at least invite you to ask ourselves, myself included, are the words that we use to speak about People different than us, marginalized, the people who may be of a different ethnicity than we are, people who are in a different social class than we are, people who have a different moral standard than we do. Can I at least ask us, are our words that we say about these people, are they defined by and shaped by the character of God. God enlists our participation with him. Listen to the words of Isaiah chapter 1, verse 16 through 17. Stop doing wrong, learn to do right. Now that sounds like a dad, doesn't it? A fatherly advice. Stop doing wrong, learn to do right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. The second example of pure religion is to keep oneself from being polluted 
by the world. But we should not miss the important point that he does not teach us to be removed from the world. Rather, he stresses living in the world, but doing so with intelligence and forethought in order to keep one's life, one's reputation, one's faith pure and secure. For James, true faith enters the surrounding culture but remains free from evil. This is the heart of evangelism in a postmodern world, that we would be a people that are a part of the world but free from the evil entanglements associated with it, that we would in fact be salt and light. For Judaism, the holiness of God was guarded from pollution. In the mind and life of Jesus, however, the holiness of God was robust and strong enough to stride in the mire and the muck of human existence. It, had a, it, it was a purifying force in the world, able to cleanse the world. James' point is that we must also be a purifying agent in the world around us. But we must be in the world. Being mindful to, preve to prevent ourselves from being sullied by it, no doubt. But we must be in it. In this, he is a faithful follower of Jesus. Now, some of us use this phrase that we are engaging with the world as a cover really to live a life of sin and do what we are, whatever we want to do. That's, that's both um, sinful, it's selfish, and it's sneaky. I mean, it's just not what God desires for his people. Pure religion has a heart that doesn't want to live in an evil world because they want to guard their lives from sin, but they choose to be in that world for the sake of Christ so that they can move in the lives of other people and help purify those around them. Well, let me close with our key concept for this morning. Our longing to set everyone else straight, in other words, not reigning in our mouths, and our inaction in other words, being hearers of the word and not doers, it destroys our Christian witness. Our longing to set everyone straight and our inaction as followers of Jesus, it destroys our Christian witness. It just does. And that's what James is getting at. Something must change. James invites us this morning to be quick to listen. In other words, to gain some perspective. Hear God's word. Be slow to speak. Don't be so quick to think that you have to set everyone straight and be slow to become angry. In other words, let the peace of Christ dwell in us richly. Let's pray. Father, would you help us today? to be a people who are quick to listen, to receive your word, and as we receive it, to allow it to be planted deep within us so that it would change us and bring about in us the character of God. Would you help us to be a people who are slow to speak, that we wouldn't be so quick to think that we have to set everyone straight, that we would we would listen to other people and their stories to gain some kind of understanding and when we speak to offer Christ-like wisdom calmly, carefully, and graciously. And Father, would we be a people who are slow to become angry? I think I need that more than most. I pray that you would help that the peace of Christ would dwell in us richly as we seek to do your will, as we receive your word in a world that is lost and hurting. May we be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And I pray all these things in his name. Amen.